And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple, coming to us straight from Texas, a.k.a. the land of Muspelheim, and, and creator of the upcoming R RPG Rupture, as well as helping to kill off the stereotype of the lonely D12. We'll get into that. The one and only Daryl Sean Price. The price is not right. How are yeah, you doing well, today, man? <laughs> thank you. Thank you for having me here. I am very happy to be here at the bar with you having mm -hmm. a drink and talking about Rupture tonight. Mm -hmm. And just... Just remember, just remember, help control the help control the elven population. Keep your elves spayed and neutered. <laughs> I support this completely. <laughs> oh, but with I what I um I sometimes shifted I sometimes shifted around. I just like going with elves simply because of, of a running gag that I've had that I've had for the longest time ever since I played a dwarf who really really hated elves. <laughs> well, dwarves are by far one of my favorite species, so I, I can relate. Well, he would—he is the type of person who would spend two minutes just insulting one. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a Scottish person towards England. <laughs> um, pretty, pretty much. Um, the ins the inspiration came from the fact that I um, I have fr I have friends in Wisconsin. And Minnesota mm -hmm. and Wisconsin do not get along on anything. It's not as bad. It's not as bad as New York and Boston, but it. Can but <laughs> there's there will be some bar. There will be some barbs getting thrown back and forth. I, I see. <laughs> from what I, I haven't been there, I haven't been in Texas enough times. But from from what I've heard, there's a similar relationship with Oklahoma and Texas. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. If Oklahoma does anything good, then it's because Texas graced them with it somehow. <laughs> oh. So I'd I'd like to start with the humble beginnings in a sense. Okay. Could you walk me through your first introduction to role playing games and what was it that made it stick? Oh, fantastic. I was eight years old. Um and I um, kind of a little bit personal detail here that's probably deeper than a lot of your guests go, but it's very crucial to answer this question. Um, I was born with a really rare liver disease, mm -hmm. which unfortunately causes mu muscular atrophy if I push my muscles too hard. Mm -hmm. um, because they didn't know the extent of what would happen, doctors said you're not allowed to be in PE classes and do normal things like recess activities that kids can do. So let's make sure that you're labeled as an outsider and ostracized from day one. Um, so I really didn't have a lot of friends. I remember there was this one kid who in my elementary school also didn't have a lot of friends. So I decided, well, we should be friends because we both need them. Mm -hmm. uh, went over to his house one day. We were watching, I believe it was the Labyrinth, if I remember correctly. It was either Labyrinth or Dark Crystal. I don't remember which at this point. Um, and he happened to have advanced Dungeons and Dragons sitting on his table. And I picked it up and started flipping through it and said, what the heck is this? And he's like, oh, well, I don't know how to play it. It's really complicated, but I know my dad plays it and blah, blah, blah. And I started flipping through it and I was fascinated. I'm like, wait, you create your own character and you can just be part of a story that's like what we're watching? Really? And I was hooked. I well, was doing everything I could to well, get let, into it. Let's, uh, let's, add, let's add a little bit of an asterisk to that. Like what we're watching, <laughs> my, minus the minus some um, David Bowie's bulge. Well, yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> I don't know, man. I could have created a Goblin King like that. <laughs> Um, you prob I'm pretty sure a decent enough DM would probably be able to understand what the hell was with the fire dancing. Yeah, absolutely. And it's fun. It's funny you bring up um, labyrinth, given that it um, ended up getting kind of kind of a so kind of a solo RPG um, earlier this year. Yeah, it did it actually yeah. get its own solo RPG. Yeah. Ooh, now um, I gotta look it up. It's, Why it's, are you making me spend more money? <laughs> but, 
because because my because my crusade has always been about expanding horizons, and I and wow. I end up having a talent for finding for finding interesting things. I blame I blame it on all my all my years spending way too much spending enough time in libraries. I was given a spare set of keys. <laughs> Completely understandable. Mm -hmm. Completely understandable. So, but... yeah, that was my intro to TTRPGs, and I found a group as quick as possible, and I had to run the game because nobody else wanted to dare take on that role. Hey, where have I heard that before? <laughs> <laughs> the forever DM. Yeah, I um, there have, there have been two there have been two really bad um, PSA style gags that I have con that I have considered scripting and ed and editing. For for the podcast, one of them is the one of them is the adopted adopted D twelve um charity. Mm -hmm. You know, kind kind of doing a parody of those of those cheesy ASPCA commercials. You know, for for you know for five cents a day, you can adopt this you can adopt this puppy. Right. <laughs> um, the other the other one is um D is DMs anonymous. You know, a, a support group for <laughs> for forever DMs. <laughs> oh, I love it. You know, and I think Rupture would welcome both of those with open arms because mm -hmm. the way we have things set up. Yeah, and since I since I kind of hinted at that, the D twelve for a lot for a lot of games, even even by my standard of a lot of games, is one of the more neglected types of die in in the in the entire bag. Mm-hmm. So obviously, some obviously some games are some games are going to use d20s. Some are going to use pools. Some are going to use singulars. But the only other the only but there are only two other major games that I've cut that I've covered on this sh on my channel that have utilized the d12 in some form. Um, that being Tefra. Not just for weapon damage. Yeah, not just not just for weapon damage. That. Not just for weapon damage or for whatever the hell the barbarian does when he isn't being incompetent. Uh, but th those are Tefra and mm -hmm. Encore. Those are. I am not actually familiar with either. Tefra is steampunk world, while Encore has a bit more in common with pul with pulp SF, especially especially the likes of John Carter, just with a bit oh, more okay. of a uh, Mesopotamian flavor to its. Approach. Fantastic. Oh. Um, I I tell I tell a partial lie because um, Riddle of Steel also used D12s, and a good chunk of the ones I mentioned were using them in a pool. Got it. Very interesting. Oh. Um, yeah, not a lot will use a standalone D12. Mm-hmm. So what what prompted what prompted you to go? Let's let's first go into the. The creation, the process that led to the creation of Rupture, and what led you to pick D12 as the Rome that all roads lead to? <laughs> okay, so um, coming back to my story, it was many, many years later when I was uh, married and I grew up in a very conservative Christian home who thought D&D &D was of the devil anyway ended up marrying into a similar conservative Christian family who mm -hmm. basically told me get rid of all that stuff. And I did. Um, I ended up not doing so hot mentally. I uh, had some issues that I was trying to work on myself and went to a therapist. And when I went to the therapist, I had a binder, probably about three inch thick binder full of everything I could figure out of my own Jungian archetypes, what's going on in my head, how they all play with each other, what it, what that creates as a result in my real world, etc. And brought it to this therapist and just started flipping through this binder. So to the point that the first three sessions, the therapist was just getting caught up on everything I did in this binder. Mm -hmm. I look back now and realize I was world creating and creating characters. But uh, this therapist started asking me about the times when I was really, really happy in my childhood and the times when I just felt like I was confident and could do anything. Mm -hmm. And it was when I was playing TTRPGs. And so he pulled out a prescription pad, wrote on an actual prescription uh, piece of paper that I had to play TTRPGs weekly and handed it to me. <laughs> so I went home with a, ha ha, guess what, you wife? I get to play TTRPGs and you can't stop me. Because it's been prescribed. Mm -hmm. 
Of course, I had no books, no games, no friends, no groups at that point, and I could have gone to the local game store and tried to hunt down, but I wanted to start digging into this creativity right away. So that night, I sat down and just started cranking stuff out that was in my head. And the whole lore for the world of Rupture was cranked out in one night. Um, one, I probably really should have slept more than I did night. But as we were getting into it, me and some friends, I started exploring. I got some people who had never played TTRPGs and told them what it was like and told them what I'm doing and said, hey, come and play around with this with me and see what works. Mm -hmm. um, I decided the D12 because I'd never seen it as a main die in a system. I would played World of Darkness stuff that's pools of D10s. I played uh, Shadowrun and pools of D6s games. I played D&D &D that was a D20. And D8 didn't feel like enough. So I said, why not D12 so that we have a die that's different? than? And this is at the time that the D20 system was everything. Like everybody of every IP had a D20 something. Oh, so I'm, I'm guessing we're talking early two th early 2000s, right smack dab in the middle of that bubble. Um, it was a little bit before that. It was in the late 90s, and I was working at a comic book store at the time. So, mm -hmm. um, But yeah, I decided the D12 was too lonely, and it needed a place to call home. Also, also, um, the way, also would I, I think it would be fair of me to say, to say that... When it came when it came to D sixes and Shadowrun, you didn't have pools of D sixes. You had pounds. <laughs> yes, touche. I still have my bricks of D sixes that are Shadowrun dice. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. An event, but it's a lot of fun to roll that many dice. Let's be honest. Oh yeah, yeah, it is. Um, and it's the it's the reason why I'm paranoid enough to, to the point where I bought I bought half a dozen gi um, giant wide bowls. <laughs> because I I occupy I have the um I have the the t the the table the table is absolute um policy i.e. if the dice roll and it, and it goes off the table it didn't happen hmm. and I and I especially especially since I know some I know some people will try and will try and f will try and fudge it or say or say oh it rolled a six right. <laughs> No, and my, my mind says like, nope. You roll it in the bowl, or or it didn't, or it didn't happen. Good for you. Way to implement keeping honest people honest. Well, that that, and they know that if I that anybody who gets caught cheating has to has to has to go through the punishment game. Ooh, what's this? You have two options. On one option is a shot glass. In this shot glass, I've told this story in the past, is water, salt, sea salt. Black pepper, Tabasco sauce, Frank's red hot sauce, sriracha, and tiger sauce. Holy nuggets, Batman. This is called the pain glass. The uh, the other option is drink you is you have to drink a full bottle of bacon soda. Okay. It's exactly what it sounds like. Bacon soda is exactly what it sounds like on the tin. It is absolutely disgusting. Oh my goodness gracious! And where do you get bacon soda? I I don't remember the name of the place, but I found it at a at a at one of those novelty candy stores. I'm pretty I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure there's I'm pretty sure there's plenty of them in in, in any in any food in any city with any kind of food culture, so. Well, since you're in Texas, you could probably you could probably find you'd probably find one in Austin, since Austin seems to be foodie central. That's true, probably. Uh, but the the sole reason that I that I would go that far to de to deter cheating is I figured if I'm go if I'm going to if I'm going to stop the if I'm going to stop the problem, then I then I should make the punishment so heinous, so cruel, so un so completely ridic ridiculously painful. That even the thought of tr of trying to pull funny business would not occur. I can respect that. Oh. Okay, so who has ever actually taken the drink of pain? Um, there's been there's been a couple people. One per one person, um, one person who um 
one person who willingly did it because he said he could handle anything spicy. And um, <laughs> it's a bad idea to say, it's a bad idea to tell me that because then I'm gonna get curious to see what you, to see what the breaking point is. Right. You know, some people want to burn the world for spite. Others just want to see the ignition point. And oh okay. yeah. <laughs> Okay. It's a, it's a, it's a case of don't of of don't of don't of um don't don't say it if you can't back it up. Oh, 100 um, percent. I get it. The other the other time some the other time somebody did somebody did that is one one I caught I, I caught the I caught them I caught them bringing in the bringing in their own di their own dice that they had modded, um, and two and two. Previously, before this, he had the he had the gall to say he could beat me in an eating contest. Hmm. Hmm. I'm taking it that didn't go over so well. No, he ch no he chickened out after he chickened out after one plate. Oh jeez. So I was like, okay, th okay. There's a buffet. There's a buffet about three blocks down from where from where we are. We'll set we'll set a date and time, and we're gonna we're gonna see if you can. Of course, the funny thing is, I'm six six, and the and the guy was the guy was, um, the guy was five and a half, and he thought and he thought he could beat me. Wow. <laughs> oh. Wow. And, and after he lost, after he lost, well, yet yeah, well, punishment. <laughs> um. But, with but with that with that in mind, mm -hmm. that. Given what you mentioned earlier, that did answer one question I was going to have: is what whether or not you were more, you were a D and D lifer, or, or if you ventured around into into other games. Now, I did look at the quick start, and one of the, one of the, and one of the things that's going to be central in in my questions is the fact that said quick start didn't have a whole lot in the, in terms of character creation; it relied on some pregens. Correct. So. There, so there's a few questions that I, that I that I have. First, would it be accurate of me to say that a lot that um that rupture is skill is um skill centric, the way something the way games like World of Darkness, Shadowrun, Legend of the Five Rings, and I'd say I'd say about I'd say about sixty percent of the of the games you're gonna find are skill centric. Um. Yes, in the the roles are going to feel very similar to a skill centric game, mm -hmm. but the skills are so trimmed down and so um, minimal. I, I like I'll give you an example. Um, underneath each of the attributes, you've got strength, agility, intelligence, charisma, mm -hmm. willpower, luck, things like that. But underneath strength and agility, you have um, one skill for strength that is just called uh, power melee, mm -hmm. and it covers all hand to hand weapons of any sort. Mm -hmm. You have one skill under strength that's called power range that covers any sort of ranged weapon that you're using strength with. And then the same thing for agility. It's finesse melee or finesse range. And that's it. It covers ev any role you want to do with any hand-to-hand -hand weapon or ranged weapon is under those two skills. Yeah. Um, with that in mind, what what would be the... Obviously, I'm not going to ask you to go through the entire weapon list, but what would be the dividing line between a between a power melee and ranged weapon and a finesse um, melee and ranged weapon? I have my guesses, but I'd, I'd like to see if I'm on the same page. Wait, wait, wait. I want to know your guesses first before I answer that, because I can promise we're probably not, but I'm curious. Um, Just in case. I am think I'm thinking that a that power that power melee ones. Are ones that are go are power melee and ranged weapons are going to be ones that are going to be very dependent on applying on applying raw strength rather than knowing where where to hit. Um, axes, hammers, maces, flails, um, great obviously great obviously great weapons um, would count would count under that kind of thing. I'm trying. It would be tempting to say one hand versus two hand, but I find that's a little too easy. And um, whereas on the on the ranged end of things, I could see a power range thing being, say, um, throwing ja throwing javelins or um, or certain t or certain types of bows. As somebody who's draw as somebody who's drawn a bow, those it is not easy. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, 
especially those compound ones. You can get those will give you a workout. <laughs> yes, they will. Um, and finesse ones are finesse weaponry would be more would be more about um, hitting the hitting the right hitting the right spot rather than ra rather than just hitting vi really really hard. So swords, knives, spe um, spears. Some pos halberds might be a little bit debatable. Um, when it comes to ranged weapons, things like good good old fashioned sl good old fashioned slings, your um, crossbows, that kind that kind of thing. Okay, I like the way you think, and that's a, how it was originally. But I'll tell you, we've done a lot of changing of rupture before we brought it to the cub the public. Mm -hmm. um, there is no distinction, and I'll give you an example. Uh, and this came up in a playtest game we were doing where originally we had long blades being an agility-based weapon skill and we had um and somebody argued well this big heavy claymore really ought to be a strength weapon but you know i get that this long blade that's a rapier ought to be an agility weapon etc cetera, etc cetera. and we thought we could go one of two ways we could go and make things a lot more detailed adding some crunchiness and complication but one of the core values we had was to simplify the crunchy and get back to the narrative mm -hmm. We decided it doesn't matter what weapon you're using. For example, let's say you are a big, huge, tough barbarian that's all reliant on strength. Mm -hmm. And you decide, I'm going to use a dagger with my strength-based melee skill. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're going to go up and stab, doesn't matter where, but as hard as you can, as many times as you can with that dagger. To get through whatever pieces of your target you can. Mm -hmm. There, it's a strength-based skill at that point. So you can use any of the weapons that are in our equipment with either skill. It's the matter of you describing how you're using the weapon that makes more, or that has a lot more validity than what the weapon is. All right. Now this brings me to to my next question, mm -hmm. and that is the that now obviously you're obviously you have you have you have a set you have set up for species and you have set up for classes. So. One of the things that I, one of the things that I'm curious about, and we can kind of we can probably use this to segue into what you're calling um, story-based creation, is is that is how is this a is this a freeform type of character creation or is this an archetype-focused type of character creation? <clears throat> um, I. It is free form in the fact that we encourage you to use your imagination. There are classes, though, mm -hmm. and species. And the reason why is we want to give you guidelines. We don't want to give you hard rules about what you will and won't do. We want to give you guidelines that might help you flesh out what you think would make a best character. Mm -hmm. One of the things that our playtesters have loved, for example, when it comes to character creation, is before we get into all the stats and all the numbers and how, how your skills line up, we start you on a background generator. And it talks about what region you're from, and it helps you detail out who your family was and what are some of the actual personal things that have happened to you up to this point in your life. Mm -hmm. And they can be good or they can be bad. And there's a lot of randomness in that to say, hey, sometimes you don't always know what cards life has dealt you. So here's the cards life dealt you. Now what are you going to do moving forward with that? Yeah. Um, and so when you get into there, that's where a lot of the free form comes in mm -hmm. is here's a lot of details that are going to be different every single time you create, let's say um, a troll warrior. And that's on the tip of my mind. Cause it's the last character I created in rupture was a troll warrior. Mm -hmm. um, but one troll warrior is not going to look or feel or have the same flavor as another troll warrior very drastically. So because of the way, because of the free form elements that are built into it, if that makes sense. Yeah, I get I get where you're going with this. Now, that does that does bring me to to how to how cla to um how classes are going to work because how species generally work. I think I think from the preview images on the Kickstarter, I got I got a bit of a vibe for it. Um, hey. a a modifier a modifier to attributes and and a unique ability. Now, obviously, there's more narratively, but but. But that's something that go that's something that goes without that goes without saying. So I'm not focusing on that at this moment. Okay. When it comes to classes, are they in in some in some cases like this? I've seen it where classes are a starting package of at a of suggested attributes, skills, equipment, and so on. And then and then after after that you're after that it's um it's full free form. 
or in some cases it's a start it's a starting setup with so, with some um with some with some perks or whatnot as you as you advance um as in the case in the case of the latter an example of this kind of thing might be say um role master right oh um, um it's actually the former so you've got six class skills mm-hmm the only reason we identify specific class skills is these ones, because you are trained in them, are protected from when you roll a one. It's not always going to be a critical failure. You might just be able to add up the one depending on what happens afterwards. Mm-hmm. Um, so that you don't have uh, the possibility of the thief who's trained all their life to be sneaky, critically fail and ruin the entire plot that they were building everything around. Mm-hmm. It's less of a chance anyway. Not that it's impossible. It can happen. It's a parachute. Um, Exactly. And after that, you've got, it is completely free form. You can choose any class or any skill you want, including everybody can be a spellcaster in this game. You want to go get a magic skill that lets you cast a spell, do it. So get, so gishes are, gishes are going to be easier to, to work with. And speaking of, speaking of skills, yes. um, one particular thing that, that you're doing that's, Unfortunately, even even by my experiences, I don't see happening all that much. Is the is the concept of le- is the concept of learning by doing? I think the last game mm-hmm. I covered that did that did that was um, Augusta Universalis, which is one a real deep cut, and two um, is based on is based on a syst- based on a system that still ha- that still has whose universal version still hasn't been fully translated in, from its native Italian. Huh. Um, but the the idea of the, I think although I think um I think some versions of um ba- of basic role playing a la Rune a la RuneQuest have done have done it actually right. yeah yeah it has just not in the same way um but what pr- what prompted you to do to take this to take the idea of um using your skill using your skills helps you advance them. Um, honestly, it is the old Cyberpunk 2020 system. I can, I can go, I can go with that. I'm, st- I'm still, I'm still waiting for, for the day when one per, when one person, um, brings up, brings up, um, first edition Cyberpunk. Mm-hmm. <laughs> in, in the, in these things, whenever, whenever Cyberpunk is brought up, it's almost always 2020 without fail. Sure. Well, that is the one that I know, and that's the one I played. So that's obviously the one I'm going to bring up. But yeah. now I'm going to go look up the original, just because you piqued my interest. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not going to. It's um between between those two. Between those two, um, 2020 is the more refined one. Um, and of course, there was one before Red. There was one more edition, but um, we don't talk about that. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Um, well. And I'll tell you, one of the things that I loved about it, and I tweaked it a little bit Mm -hmm. when it comes to learning skills. um, Yeah, you learn from successes and you mark them. But also, when you try something you've never done before and don't have a skill in, and and I use the example of, okay, you guys are all stuck in a situation where you're going to have to be sneaky to get out. Roll stealth. Well, I don't have it. Roll it anyway and just take your raw agility score. And if you roll well enough, Guess what? You just marked a success in stealth. So your stealth zero has one success, and you're well on your way to learning that as a skill. Mm-hmm. Um, which also one of the things we did is when you critical failure, five critical failures, and your skill ranks up as well mm-hmm. because you learn from your mistakes. Um, and if you get a critical success, you get two successes. Mm-hmm. So ten successes or five critical failures, and you start going up, and, and those ranks. Can add up pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. Now, since you since you brought up um, spell casting, I want to get into I want to get into that for a bit. Nice. So, obviously, with the way with the way you've with the way you've brought it up, everybody can everybody can be what um what is known in what is known in my circles as a gish. Mm-hmm. Um, that be that being those characters who can do a bit of martial and do a bit of casting. Um, depending on depending on the game in question, they're either um, a build that's full of traps, or the or their or their easy mode. Looking at looking at you, looking at you, O D and D elf. 
well, not not OD and D, but er the very early races class era elf was infamous for being OP. Yep. Um. And that, given the given the fact that a lot of things hinge on skills, do you have do you have s some games I've seen have it where spell casting as a whole is its own skill, whereas others have it that different spheres or different styles of spell casting are individual skills. Where do you fall uh, into that paradigm? We definitely are of the spheres and different styles of spell casting, except. I gotta put a caveat on here because I think where you're going with this, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot of editions of D&D &D and Pathfinder and things like that have, well, if you're a druid, you cast this way. If you're a bard, you cast this way. If you're a wizard, you cast this way. And it's all completely drastically different. And it's almost like a whole new system you have to learn depending on what type of character you are. Well, we fun... do not do that. The funny thing The funny thing with that, with... Actually, the funny thing is when you when you bring up um, D and D style casting is the fact that they talk about how you ca how you cast a certain way if you're a spell casting class, but don't commit. Because mm -hmm. I I remember I remember always asking why why is it that why is it that ranger why is it that rangers and druids are casting one from the same from the same book as um as clerics and two casting in largely the same way, and I don't I don't believe modifying the pool of what you have of it, what you have available is sufficient um but when but i do i do remember at one point doing my own doing my own hack where um evocation illusion enchantment and so on were skills and depend, and that and use and use that as my and use that as a basis that's that's kind of what i meant when i was referring to when i was referring to the latter um, gotcha. Well, in that case, it is somewhat the latter. We have um, lots of different schools of magic that you can mm -hmm. learn to cap in. So there's earth magic, air magic, water magic, uh, mm -hmm. life magic, death magic, nature, divine magic, etc. Um, but no matter what you choose, it's exactly the same mechanics. Mm -hmm. You're going to roll whatever that, whatever that uh, school is that you've learned. Let's say it's water magic. Mm -hmm. You roll water magic. Or you roll, add your water magic, add intelligence. That's mm -hmm. it. It'd be the same thing if you knew fire magic. Just plug in fire magic in its place. Yeah. Now, with with that in, with that in mind, the other the other quest, I I do appreciate that you're using a spell point system because one of my long standing whipping boys has been the Van, has been the Vancian casting model. Mm -hmm. I have ne even in my earliest days, I never liked it. I only tolerated it. Oh, I'm with you there. <laughs> and the, the that brings, given given the fact that you are using a spell point system, um, mm -hmm. is it a case where you ha where you would have to spend you would have to spend magic points before you even start rolling, or it, or is it or is it a case of you on you only have to spend it if you if the roll actually succeeds? Um, they kind of go hand in hand in the way we do it that it's almost hard to separate. And I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. So, because to be able to cast, everybody has a token. It can be a wand. It can be a staff. It could be an amulet that you wear. Mm -hmm. It could be the skull of a rat you found behind your mom's house. It doesn't matter what it is. Mm -hmm. It's an implement you use to channel magic through to cast the spell. So what you do is, the, is you say, I'm going to cast drowsy on this giant over here. Mm -hmm. Um, you roll and the points are taken away as you roll because if you critical fail, for example, then that glyph that's etched into that token that you have breaks and shatters and becomes a wisp that is the living embodiment of that spell. Mm -hmm. Do you now have this little creature floating around casting drowsy randomly on everything? That's all it does. So magic points kind of have a life of their own. We're just learning to channel them in a way that creates effects. Mm -hmm. I'd I'd say that's cer that's certainly an interesting way to ha to handle um handle mishaps instead of doing a ta a table of mishaps, which some might, some might be beneficial and others might be disastrous. <laughs> um, it's true. But with but um, are the when it comes to when it, the other av the other avenue when it comes to spe when it comes to spell use is acquisition. Is it a case where, in order where um, 
where the where the primary way to get to learn new spells is to find them out in the world. Yes, absolutely. Um, but magic is so prevalent in this world, it's very easy to find a library or a book or something. And it is implied that it's just not a book full of, here's a spell you could learn, here's how you do it. It's a book on your school of magic. Mm -hmm. So it's a book that describes the theory of water magic. And you, by studying that, would learn how to do a new effect because you've studied it so well. And everyone that is a spell casting class, because we do have mage mm -hmm. as a class, gets as part of their starting kit um, two books within that are in their uh, magic school. Mm -hmm. So they can study as they go and take a couple hours and say, I want to learn how to make water do this. Let me go study and see if I can figure it out. Yeah. Now, when it comes to, when it comes to the spells that are potentially available, are most of the spell effects a fire and forget affair, or is there a degree of custom customizability with spell use? Oh, there is a lot of customizability, because some of them are instant, some of them last certain rounds, some of them create an effect in the world that's permanent, some, and there's so many different ways for things to happen. And I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. One of the common first order spells is Elevate, and mm -hmm. it's whatever your medium is. So, for example, if it's Earth, then you create a pillar of Earth that elevates something 100 feet in the air. Mm -hmm. And it's meant to just elevate the Earth. But so many people have used that as an attack spell, even though it doesn't have attack stats. And there's ways to modify any effect you have. If you can describe it well, we definitely have the rule of cool in this game. Mm -hmm. But if you can describe it well, you get bonuses. You get to do it. Yeah. Um, now, when it comes when it comes to when it comes to your schools of magic, for lack of a better term, um, are the major are the majority of the spell lists rooted in rooted in the the base for Hellenistic elements, or are there are there other um, avenues? Um, there are so many other avenues. In mm -hmm. fact, um, thaumaturgy is its own school of magic. For example, the study mm -hmm. of just magical energy itself. Mm -hmm. um, there are, in fact, the Hellenistic elements are often. Um, so there's illegal magics, there's legal magics within this lore, mm -hmm. and the Hell Hellenistic elements sit on the edge of that because they need prior authorization or they're illegal. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, you've got things like death and chaos and time and telepathy and life and order and, uh, gosh, I'm going to have to pull up the book now. <laughs> no. I don't have my whole book memorized. What? If it means, if it's any consolation, most people I've had on the show don't have their whole book memorized. And given the size yeah. of some of them, it would be it would be an ask to have them do it. Absolutely, I get it. So, but yeah, there no, there is so much freedom in what you can do with the types of spells and the types mm -hmm. of schools that are out there, and doubling up on them. I know we've got a player in one of our games right now that is all about the illegal magics, and so they have got both chaos and telepathy. Mm -hmm. um, illusion is another one illusion is one of the schools as well that was the one that kept slipping my mind there's nature and divine which are only accessible to a druid and or a cleric and a paladin for the other mm -hmm. um, but they still the roles are the same mechanically it's just a little bit different flavor in the way they describe how they cast Yeah. instead of using a token and channeling pure energy a cleric or a paladin is using a relic of their god, and it's their god that is blessing them with the ability to do these effects. Mm -hmm. And given given the given that rule of cool approach, I get I get the feeling you're not that um paladins in this setup are certainly not going to run into the, run into some of the things that make paladins a problem class in some other games. <laughs> Absolutely not. No, no, no. In fact, it's so fun to watch. One of the things we don't have, by the way, is alignments. Mm -hmm. um, and instead of alignments, we have you choose your motivation, and we split it into the four, the five Gs. Mm -hmm. So it is, I'm out for glory, I'm out for gold. Actually, we, we switched that to greed, because not everybody's mm -hmm. treasure is money. Mm -hmm. So it's glory, greed, good, um, guts, or you're out to solve your grief. Mm hmm so we have you pick one of the five G's, and then we have you come up with a personal goal. And it can be anything from I want to go, uh, I want to go right the wrong that happened to my parents before I was born, to I want to become the richest fighter in all of such and such kingdom. And whatever it is, as you start to actually take action towards your personal goal, you get extra bonuses because you're 
really playing the story of your character well. And those are the only things that, and, and the principle behind this is this. One of the things that always uh, kind of bothered me about traditional alignments is when I found a race in another campaign or in another system that I loved, but they're only allowed to be evil. Well, but I want to look like that and be good. Well, you're not supposed to. But if you do, you have to use all these rules to change it. Mm. I'm like, you know, there's a situation where I believe every being in this universe is, has both evil and good potential inside of them. And the difference is, mm -hmm. what are they doing right now? If you've got a personal goal that you are so committed to, but normally you don't lie, but you know telling this one lie will get you one step closer to that goal, you might lie. Yeah. And with that, with the, with that, in, with that in mind... Mm -hmm. Um, when it comes to, when it comes to, <clears throat> since you, you mentioned, you hinted at level, you hinted at levels of orders when it, mm -hmm. when it comes to, when it comes to spells, um, is one, is, is one of the, one of the potential, one of the potential ways you can, you can upgrade, you can upgrade a spell just by casting it at a higher order than normal or are they, um, or are they set? Oh, okay. So the orders are not, um, you can't, okay. So you're not going to take elevate and make it level three or order three elevate. Mm -hmm. The orders are just ways for politically classifying how much effect a spell would have on the world. Mm -hmm. Um, so for example, elevates always an order one spell. You can use it in creative ways and have some massive effects, but it is not something that inherently is meant to disrupt the world to the point that it needs a classification of order seven. To get to Order 7, you've got to find a Grand Master of that school because these are world-altering spells. These are world-altering effects. You can't just learn that from a book. Mm -hmm. So they are different spells as you go up through the Orders. And with the with the set, with the setup that you with the setup that you have, especially when it comes to when it comes to customization. Um, when I when I was mentioning spell customization, one of the things I was kind of I was kind of hint I was kind of hinting at is the question of meta magic. Uh huh. Um, I know you mentioned rule. I know you mentioned rule of cool, but in the case of say in the case of say elevate, could that could could somebody say could somebody say mess around with it so that they multicast it so it's targeting um uh, more th more than one opponent? Oh heck yeah. That happens all the time. Mm -hmm. And yes, you can customize effects. You can customize how you target. You can customize lots of things. One of the ways that we have a huge customization in the game is everybody starts with a legacy item, which is an item that's special to your character in some way that gives you an effect of some sort that um, just by channeling your magical energy into it, you create that effect. And as you level up, so does that item. Mm -hmm. So um, we have... One of the one of the characters in one of our recent games ended up having a legacy item that allowed them to mix two schools of magic into one spell, to have a very unique or have very unique effects based on that. Mm -hmm. And with with that in with that in mind, the what would, you you already mentioned what would be first order what would be what would be what would be the equivalent for say second or third or third order um the equivalent to what let me make sure i'm answering the question you're asking um uh, as in what what would be some examples of of a second order spell what would be some examples of a third order spell and so on let me pull up the book and i will read you some that pop out to me just as a quick sampling mm -hmm. um so I love the mouse wheel for books like this. And... Mm -hmm. Okay, so for example, um, let's go into third order. Um, so in third order, you would have spells like uh, in air magic, you have something called Gale, which really creates this massive storm that does damage, that blows things around. You're looking at like hurricane force winds at that point. Mm -hmm. Each order is exponentially stronger in the type of effect it has than the other, which is why there's only seven orders so far. Mm -hmm. um, and it's you could get up to a level 15 character and maybe barely be thinking about 
getting into a seventh order spell. Um, one that's an interesting one in time magic, for example, the only third order is foresight. Mm-hmm. You actually are predicting the future at that level. Um, or at third order is when druids start taking on permanent animalistic characteristics with their spells so that they start to emulate the animals that they have um, studied for so long. And I'll give you an example of a seventh order just to show you how drastic these become very quickly. Um, So if I go into seventh order, uh, Mountain Fortress, this is an earth spell where the Mm -hmm. caster actually creates a massive fortress on a high cliff. Walls will be hidden at the peak with walls hidden at the peak of the tall mount, of a tall mountain, excuse me. Um, only earth magic is the only type of magic that works in the fortress, and any time they cast it, it creates a new fortress for them. Um, mm-hmm. They can only have one at a time, but they are instantly healed upon entering the for- fortress. It is completely protected. They may travel there magically after meditating for 10 minutes and do the same to return. Mm-hmm. Um, or telepathy is an interesting one. They have a spell of the seventh order called hive mind where the caster is permanently linked um, to a target every single time they cast this spell. The target and the caster share thoughts, senses, and can communicate without restriction as long as they're both conscious. Mm -hmm. And then seventh order is where you've got a permanent resurrection spell for life. Um, Soul anchor for death, where they attach their life force to an object outside of themselves and cannot be killed as long as that object's not destroyed. Um, So if they were to ever effectively be killed they just fall unconscious and once they're healed again they wake back up until that item itself is destroyed whatever that is Mm -hmm. good old-fashioned lich them exactly oh now since we there's been there's been given the fact that you're using a hat a handful of a handful of classes i'm guessing that i'm guessing that a good chunk of them are the are the kind of um, archetypical classes that one would that one would expect. Um, yeah, there are. We've got we've got your basic. Um, well, uh, yes and no. <laughs> the the answer is yes. There are some archetypical classes, or they're enough that they feel like archetypical classes. Like for example, we do have a bard, but a bard uses no magic inherently because of its class. They are all about the performance. They're all about the persuasion they are all about the songs the stories the artistry not the magic itself the diplomacy exactly they're your face more than anything else um we do have assassin as a core class um which would often fall just under the big umbrella of rogue in a lot of places and then we have thief which is separate from assassin Mm -hmm. so you don't lump those two together we do have a barbarian um, Bounty Hunter is a core class because the lore has that because magic is now flowing through everything in creation, including all people. Some people haven't learned to channel the mana in their veins and start to go insane from it and become mana torn. And mm-hmm. these mana torn people, there's uh, they have bounty hunters out to collect them to bring them to places where they can hopefully be healed. Of course, no one's ever been healed before, but it's so they're not a danger to society. I mean, we do have cleric, druid, paladin, and then mage is basically your spellcaster of any sort. Mm-hmm. Whether you want to flavor it like the way a sorcerer would, or like a wizard, or anything else, go for it. We do have monk. Um, <laughs> we have ranger. And Band- we've got... Pandering to me a little bit, aren't you? Sure, absolutely. <laughs> and the monk is one of my favorite. I'll tell you, it's so interesting the way we have built our monks because you can decide one of your main attributes is agility or strength depending on what type of monk you want to be Mm -hmm. um and then what we do with the with our willpower skills so meditate resist magic and empathy is what the monk has they become very very in tune with their target Mm -hmm. so it's a unique way to play yes we have classes that that would be familiar enough with enough unique twist that you're playing in a whole new way Mm -hmm. now with that, with that particular thing in mind, um, I wanted to ask a bit on like on what you on what you refer to as legacy items. Mm-hmm. Um, like when when I when I look at how you have it how you have it described, I'm kind of reminded of the one unique thing from Thirteenth Age, just with um, actual mechanical weight. Mm-hmm. Um, is the is the legacy item essentially a a MP use item that 
is going to be unique to each character? Uh, yes, absolutely. And in fact, one of the things we tell you to do is you have to name it and give us the story behind why that item so is special to you. And it can be anything. I mean, we've had people who were wearing a ring that contained the soul of their ex-wife in it. And their ex-wife in-game, not out of game. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. uh, we've had people that um, ended up having a weapon that anytime they... Uh, here's a unique one. It's He's got a sword that when he channels magic into it, creates a spectral version of itself, and he leaves the real one behind. He uses mm -hmm. the spectral version to go attack, and when he's done, he can just pull himself back to the original sword. Uh, now I I know there I know that you have have a setup about about what would be what would be thresh what would be thresholds for like for, uh, of MP use for legacy items. There is there is one when I did um when I did the sword timber experiment <clears throat> last month. Uh -huh. There was one there was one particular item I I was I was fo I was fond of that we ended up creating. Um and that we and that is the it's. Its name is Needle. It is a sh it is a short sword who that has um that has the sides kind of rounded off. It's only good for it's only good for thrusting, not for not for any sort of slicing. Okay. But the key thing with it is if you if you stab some if you stab someone's shadow with it, they can't move. Their shadow oh. is literally stuck is literally stuck in place. So you pin the shadow wherever it is. Yeah. Love it. Um in would would something like that be consider be eligible for a legacy item or would that be a, would that be pushing it a bit much? Oh, no, 100%. In fact, I would at level 1, I would say, okay, you can do that up to 5 times a day. Mm -hmm. Then as you level up, it might be more times a day or it might be I'm pinning multiple shadows or and it just keeps gaining in power. It I I'd say e I'd guess either that or um or the or you can or you can do you can use this on something bigger. Yes, exactly. Um, exactly. The as as cliche as cliche as it is, I have I have done the whole thing of having a pen transform into transform into a sword because because I ha I cannot resist cliches. <laughs> Oh, you should watch our Saturday streams on NerdWorks Media. We're not doing it this week, but mm -hmm. the entire, it's not me narrating. It's my business director. Mm -hmm. And she has us in a city where every cliche has come true. <laughs> so we walked in and it started raining cats and dogs. We tripped over piles of salt that were mixed with dirt because of salt of the earth. You name it. Oh, all the bridges burnt down in the city. Um, it was every cliche has come to life and we're supposed to figure out why the heck it's happening. Has there... I I can only imagine I can only imagine how how um how how itakum nashmekt would en would end up get would end up getting used, which is a ru which is a Russian idiom that it literally translates to "that's for chickens to laugh at." <laughs> oh my gosh! Please don't tell her that we're going to have laughing chickens. <laughs> She's like everyone. We in fact we know for sure. Nobody in the town's lying to us because all of their pants have not burnt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, what are you shoot? What are you shooting for as far as a total page count? Um, I actually can give you a total page count now. So the manual is completely done mm -hmm. with spaces in place for the artwork. What we're doing with the Kickstarter is we want to pay for the rest of the artwork. We've got a studio who's done most of what you've seen so far, and we mm -hmm. want to get the artwork done and then get it published and out. So the total page count for uh, the player's guide is 167 pages, mm -hmm. which is not chunky at all compared to a lot of them that are out there. Now, the narrator's handbook, which really is just a handbook, it is meant just as a supplement to help narrators with world building and especially to help them to help narrators who have never really done their own world building. They're so used to modules break out of that and say, we've given you enough to play with. But there's enough freedom here for you to start creating your own cities and doing your own things. So that's only 36 pages long. Mm -hmm. So that's what you're looking at for total page count for both books. Um, there is a bestiary, but we actually have that as a deck of cards. Mm -hmm. So that what you do is, let's say your um, party is adventuring in the 
frozen tundra. You would pull out the 12 cards that apply to tundra, roll the mm -hmm. D12, whichever one is the number you roll, there's your encounter. If you want to do a random encounter. Or you've got the whole deck of cards with what creatures would be in what region that you can pull from to create actual campaigns around. Mm -hmm. And I will I will certainly be looking forward to, to seeing how to seeing how this kind of thing um, comes around. Nice. But uh, well, I will definitely make sure that you get access to all the stuff we have currently, so you mm -hmm. can dig into the real books and the bestiary and everything else. Mm -hmm. uh, and with, but with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. Well, you're very welcome, Mildred. It's been a blast. I mm -hmm. love sharing stories more than anything else, and mm -hmm. life is full of them. Oh yeah. And anytime you see fit to return, whether it's to whether it's to figure out even worse, uh, even worse cliches and puns, it, <laughs> or or to or to or to la or to laugh at the dice gods screwing someone over because the dice gods hate everyone equally. Yep, the, it is true. The door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Well, thank you, and I will toast to that. I've actually got a drink in front of me. So. Skull. Skull. And of course, a, yep, and of course a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule f to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here. On the open bar um, of the internet. And let me throw out a mm -hmm. quick little shout out. Anybody mm -hmm. who's interested in learning more, go ahead over to rupturerpg.com and mm -hmm. send me your info and I'll make sure that you get into our Discord server. And of, co and of, course, there, of course, there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>